Hello everyone, thank you for participating in this webinar. My name is Ant van der Oude. I'm Field Application Specialist of the NextGen PCR at Molecular Biology Systems. And in this presentation, I will share new data and knowledge about accelerating monkeypox and SARS-CoV-2 sequencing for our whole genome sequencing using NextGen PCR and Nanopore sequencing, which will allow to go towards more real-time genomic surveillance. And that's also something that the World Health Organization states because the global genomic surveillance strategy for pathogens includes uh, generating genomic data, data that is actually generated in your laboratory, which has an impact on how we deal with viruses because the generated data will be aligned to uh, on cloud uh, analysis to search for similar similarities and differences. This data is then used uh, to monitor the disease, tailor public health interventions, develop medicines and vaccines, and in order to stop outbreaks or eradicate diseases. The aim of this presentation is mainly focused on how we can actually improve the generating of genomic data, whereby we actually use SARS-CoV-2 sequencing as an example how we can actually strengthen the goal of the World, World Health Organization, uh, whereby the states to strengthen genomic surveillance and have a more skilled, quality and timely appropriate public health actions within local to global surveillance systems. So if we take a closer look at SARS-CoV-2 sequencing at the moment, we actually see two main protocols that are used. So we also we have the Arctic uh, protocol from George Quick which use 99 amplicons, which are, around, which are around 400 base pairs. And we have the Midnight Protocol from Nikki Fried and Olin Seelander, where they used around 29 to 30 amplicons, which are around 1200 base pairs. We choose to optimize the Midnight Protocol. And that's mainly because the reduced numbers of amplicons in the Midnight Protocol allows for more consistent sequencing uh, across the whole genome and thereby the the annealing of the primers is just 4.5 percent of the whole genome which decreases the chance for any viral mutations in the primer binding sites um, which lowers the chance that we have to exchange the primers or put in an additional update in the primer set and if we take even a closer look at the midnight protocol we see it's actually divided in different kinds of steps. So we have the cDNA, which takes around 20 minutes. We have the amplification steps, which takes four hours. We have the rapid barcoding, and then we have the library prep for nanopore sequencing. The total library prep from sample before it goes into the nanopore sequencer takes around five and a half, five and a half hours. And that's quite long, especially uh, if you are getting samples which are urgent in the midday. So we actually looked into this workflow and what would be the main bottleneck. And what we actually saw is that using our technology, we can uh, actually decrease the PCR time from four hours, maybe to less than 30 minutes, which really has an impact on how laboratories are using uh, their uh, resources. Because if we uh, look at the workflow and we have the conventional library prep, which takes around five hours and three and a half hours to four hours PCR, you are already taking the whole day before you can start with the nanopore sequencing. And depending on the amount of samples you are using, a nanopore sequencing can take up to two hours, but also slightly longer. If we decrease the PCR time from three and a half hours to less than 30 minutes, we can have a sample prep from one and a half to two hours, which allows you to uh, get faster sequencing data, increase throughput because you can do more runs on a single day. But the main benefit would be lab flexibility, which means that even if you get your samples in the midday, you can still process them the same day which allows you to get faster sequencing data. And that's actually what we did uh, in our laboratory in collaboration with uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center 
and Avant University of Applied Science. We performed first experiments on an aquaculture gel using our 27 minute PCR and used optimized uh, PCR master, mix master mixes for our next gen PCR in such a way that we could decrease the annealing and the extension using our next gen PCR. And if we look at the aquaculture gel here on the right side, we even get clear amplification even at 10 copies per microliter. However, we first experiments, they are performed using synthetic RNA uh, on agarose gel. So we really have to test it on clinical samples and perform sequencing to understand the uh, yeah, genome coverage of all the different amplicons and if this is sufficient. And that is actually what we did at Amsterdam University Medical Center. We performed a small experiment on clinical samples with three different CT values. 20, uh, CT value 20.93, 28.46, and CT value 30.49. And we actually compared our data from the next PCR, which you can see in this graph in blue, with the conventional PCR and the conventional uh, workflow, which is used for the midnight protocol. And what we can actually see is that using the faster PCR, the 27-minute PCR, we did get uniform coverage of the whole genome and similar to the conventional PCR, which is also seen when we look at the whole coverage of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Using the 27-minute PCR, we obtained more than 99% genome coverage of the whole genome of SARS-CoV-2, which was even slightly higher than the conventional PCR system, where we had a few uh, below 99% coverage. At least we can say, because it's quite a small uh, sample set, we can actually say that using the fast PCR, it will not be less than the conventional PCR. However, we wanted to test this workflow on more clinical samples. However, during this time, the world faced uh, a monkeypox outbreak uh, worldwide. And therefore we actually shift our prior priorities um, to monkeypox sequencing. And that was also mainly because in the region of Amsterdam, there were quite a lot of cases. And what we discussed in the beginning, we wanted to have sequencing methods and generate genomic data of monkeypox which are not, which are scalable, have high quality and give fast sequencing data. So that's actually where we were looking into because the methods that were used for monkeypox sequencing were mainly metagenomics. Of course, it was working, but the coverage was quite low, which allows you uh, to multiply less samples on a single flow cell, which is increasing the cost. So therefore we thought, well, what if we can use PCR tiling for monkeypox based on the knowledge from the Midnight Protocol and the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing from Nikki Fried. And there actually we collaborated again with Amsterdam University Medical Center and also with Martin Schau Peterson from the Rich Hospital in Copenhagen in order to develop a next-gen PCR tiling approach, um, which will give faster, timely, and higher throughput sequencing data. And this was actually in more an outbreak setting because monkeypox was actually spreading. Uh, there was not that many data about monkeypox um, and we could directly apply it in the region of Amsterdam because there are relatively uh, a high amount of cases. And this way we expect to increase the coverage and even to decrease the cost because we can multiplex multiple samples on a single flow cell. So there we actually started using a amplicum based sequencing method for monkeypox, which is on one side easier and on the other side harder than SARS-CoV-2 because monkeypox, you don't have to do the reverse transcription because it's DNA. However, monkeypox, it's 190 or over 190 KB long, which is substantially longer than SARS-CoV-2. So Martin Schau-Peterson, he developed 88 primer sets 
um, which can be divided over two pools, and each pool uh, has 44 uh, primer sets. These were developed by using the primal scheme, and uh, the average amplicon size was 2.5 kb, and we had an overlap of 200 base pairs uh, between the different amplicons. And for this, we used a 42 minute PCR protocol using our Nexian PCR. The bioinformatic analysis that is used, um, the, it's used, we used the min no software high accuracy live base calling. We removed the read lengths below 100 base pairs and above uh, 4,000 base pairs from the FASTQ file. And then we used the FASTQ raw data in order to map it to the monkeypox USA 2020 uh, MA001 using minimap uh, V2. We remove unmap reads using SAM tools and we generate Crawford's per position using SIME sets V1.12. So we actually generated consensus using three consents package from the RFEM. And we used a pilot, we made a phylogenetic analysis using next strain monkeypox build. So if we looked at the data, um, we actually, uh, uh, we so we first optimized with a few different PCR settings, and then we could get our data within three days. And what we actually saw in this data is that we already obtained really high coverage uh, depth and coverage, genome you know, coverage in general. So if we look at CTVR20, we have over 99% a genome coverage, and even at CTVR22, we had saw the same. However, at CT CTVR26 and CTVR29, we saw that the coverage was coming uh, a little bit more down, whereby there were three different sites where the coverage was mostly dropping uh, quite low or below the 10 times coverage depth. Um, however, the data was actually quite amazing because we could actually amplify the whole genome of monkeypox within 42 minutes, which is quite amazing because it's 190 KB. And the data that is generated was sufficient to test a total of 40 clinical samples in the region of Amsterdam. And this data of these 40 samples was really helpful to understand the spread of monkeypox even more, which actually resulted into a neurosurveillance rapid communication paper where they looked into uh, a case um, because there was a child with an unknown source of infection in the Netherlands, uh, and they didn't understand how this child could have been infected. Even contact tracing and testing of parents of people who were in contact with the child did not give any clear data. And the sequencing data of the 40 samples in the region of Amsterdam were put into the phylogenetic tree. And in red, here on the right side, you can see the child and it's actually plotted to the older 40 positive samples. And also the sequencing data actually showed there was no direct link between the 40 samples in the region of Amsterdam and the child, and actually showing uh, that there could be even, or indicating there is more spread in the population than only within the MSM community, which we was known uh, at the beginning of the outbreak which is really knowledgeable data, which is important to guide public health interventions. We try to optimize this workflow even slightly a little bit further by increasing the primer regions of the primer set 22, 29, and 50, because there we saw three regions with lower coverage. However, using the next PCR, we did not obtain a higher coverage. We even saw more unbalancing of the sequencing data. Using the conventional PCR, it had an effect. So there we saw that for those three regions, we did get a higher or and better coverage. So in, in general, we can actually say that SARS-CoV-2 
or based on this data and the presentation, we can actually state that SARS-CoV-2 can be amplified or the whole genome can be amplified using a 27 minute uh, PCR program with the next PCR. For monkeypox, we can use a PCR tiling, which is a really feasible and increasing the quality of your data in order to uh, get better data. And you can uh, even amplify it within 42 minutes. And with the conventional PCR, it will take three and a half hours. However, what we see in the data is that we get lower coverage in three different regions. So 29, 22, and primary set 50, where we are still looking into how to optimize this. Because if we get even higher coverage and more uniform coverage, it also means that we can uh, multiplex even more samples in a single flow cell and decreasing the cost even further. So with this new workflow using NextGen PCR, we can really accelerate genomic surveillance worldwide, improve public health interventions. And this is also a good fundamental for other uh, applications. Because if you can imagine that you can amplify 190 KB, you can actually amplify every virus or every pathogen that you want using uh, PCR tiling. And the your surveillance paper also shows the impact of getting those faster sequencing data, which will be vital in managing, uh, yeah, managing pathogens in general, and which is actually uh, yeah, increasing better surveillance. So better genomic sequencing allows us to understand and monitor viruses and target our disease control more accurately. Before the end of the uh, presentations, I would like to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, MBS as our company, Avant University of Applied Science, Amsterdam University Medical Center, the Rick's Hospital in Copenhagen, and the public health uh, in Amsterdam, of the region of Amsterdam. Thank you very much for this presentation. And if you have any questions, you can always send us an email or give a question uh, in the chat. Thank you.